no good when you can't hear the speaker, I guess, if he has something to say. Maybe I do, so I'll try to uh, speak out loud. Practical actions and demonstrations. The student rebellion. Hmm. Um, my name is Christian Jurgils, and that was the topic I'm supposed to uh, say something on. Uh, my background, I started with politics um, just four years ago in a small student organization in Stockholm called the Free Moderate Students. Um, well, moderation was not really the, the, uh, the leading word when I was there, but um, the reason the name is Free Moderate Students is that the single uh, conservative liberal party in Sweden is called the Moderates, and this organization was kind of a, a part of it. Um, nowadays I work with something called the Freedom Front, and this is explained in this little uh, book with uh, an independent combat unit struggling for individual freedom and capitalism. Well, I don't, my, my English tells me that a combat unit is kind of like Rambo running around with, with machine guns. We don't do that. We uh, work very peaceful. But we, of course, fight for, for capitalism and individual freedom. What we, uh, what we did within this first, uh, within this uh, student organization is that we uh, started some actions involving breaking the law. That's not very difficult in Sweden. There are many laws to be broken. But still, I think that what I'm going to say here um, is useful and uh, it's um, the same will probably be, uh, be used in all countries. Because the Swedish model, the Swedish welfare state is not so different from, for example, the US or, or the uh, Great Britain. As a student, student organization, we, uh, we thought maybe we should do something a little provocative, like uh, students always have done. Starting a radio station was a good idea. Because, uh, well, of course, freedom of speech is important. And in Sweden, we have the, all those laws uh, that decided only the state can start radio stations. That was our big goal for this autumn session. session. When I started as, as the head of this organization, the, the radio station was the big thing. But during the summer, when the students were out of Stockholm, we had to do something also. So we thought, we open a bar in the street in Stockholm. On, because, well, maybe you have seen Stockholm, you heard about it, a lot of uh, tourists, and we have some large streets where you can, where there are no cars, and fine, we did it. We started the bar a Saturday afternoon. We just put a table on the street and with a little cloth roof on it, and we started selling. But it doesn't sound like very much, and, and it wasn't, but still it was, because beer and wine is something a little secret in Sweden. And to combine politics with alcohol is very, very no-no. So media was there covering up, and the state television, thank you, state television, the state radio, um, all the big news programs and the big uh, newspapers were there. And it was a big thing. All of a sudden, there were those moderate students standing on the street selling alcohol. They were breaking the law. We were breaking the law. 
And since this conservative party, the moderates, not at all known for libertarian ideas, in media this connection between the big conservative party and their small student organization was very nice to blow up. And there we stood, telling everyone that it's okay to break the law. Fine, we do it because the law is not just. The state does not have the right to decide whether we sell alcohol or not. We don't force anyone. It is actually not a crime. And this really um, made an influence on the Swedish debate for a short while. Um, when we started the radio station a few months later, which was the big thing, and I mean, of course, alcoholic laws, okay, I don't like them, but freedom of speech is some, somewhat more important. It is uh, even more important. But that was al almost forgotten. No one, well, the, a few media followed it up, but not much. But those two things made this moderate party become very furious. furious. They didn't like it at all. Breaking the law in Sweden is not very good, and doing it within this conservative party is even worse. And what happens, maybe all of you, uh, or some of you know, how an organization works. Here we were, five, six people that really wanted to do something and to fight for the ideas. But at the same time, there were all, all of those others, no-no people, that wanted peace within the party and within the organization. And as I understand, those of you working uh, within the Libertarian Party, for example, in, in the US, has also always gotten those problems that people want different things. Parties and organizations in that way are counterproductive. So we started the Freedom Front, or I did together with a couple of other guys uh, that really felt for libertarian ideas. And the Freedom Front then is not a party, it's just an organization which tries to influence people, which tries to take part in the debate and really show people what we believe in and what is right. For example, now we started a pub, or a big pub in Stockholm, or a party local. Uh, it's probably as big as this place, uh, 300 square meters, um, and of course it's illegal. You cannot sell beer in your own home in Sweden. And it is not ever allowed to sell beer in a place after 3 o'clock at night. But young people, party people, uh, they want to drink beer after 3 o'clock at night. In Stockholm they do at least. So, right now we have for every Friday, Saturday, three or four hundred persons partying in the Freedom Front locals in Stockholm. This spring, um, there was a police razzia, and then there was another one. What we had done was only this. We sold beer. 30 policemen coming down with guns, with dogs, 10 cars, standing, police cars, police vans, standing outside because we were selling beer. Okay, fine. They took me and some other guys to the police station for hearings and all that. Um, and we were released. Okay, we, we kept on going, of course. We uh, kept on going the next Friday and the next Saturday. And they were there again. Same thing. 
Da-na-na-na. I wait to the police station, and I mean, my thing is always to say nothing. Okay, you want to ask me questions? Fine, I'm not answering. I can tell you my name, my date of birth, but that's all. Um, and that makes the police furious, because they don't get anything out of me, and they don't get anything out of the others. And we have what we call a direct democratic organization of this pub, which means that we have no leader, and we have no one that stands above anyone else. That means that every person that is a member of this pub is actually on the highest level. So they cannot find anyone who is actually responsible. <laughs> and they can't do anything. We keep on doing this. We, we still have the pub going. We had 400 people there Friday and as many Saturday. And it's huge parties. And maybe, I mean, to, to focus only on, on alcohol sounds a little strange or stupid. And of course, with the pub, we do that. Um, but we get people there that are interested in ideas. If we get 2,000 people through this, this local every month, of course, those that are interested in ideas get to know us and get to read books. And I would say that is what is important by, with breaking laws and by acting and working libertarian without the party system, without, from, from outside, and don't go in to the party system is very important because to get acceptance from those that set the agenda for tomorrow, then you will not ever be successful if you stand on the same, uh, on the same place as all those other politicians. The problem, of course, with breaking law is whether you have the right. Is it right to break the law? I would turn it the other way around and say that uh, as a libertarian, you cannot do anything but break the law in a country like Sweden or in a country like the US or Great Britain or anywhere else. Because we will not be reliable if we don't. Because what does it mean to say that people have rights? What is the meaning? Of course the meaning is that the state or the majority does not have the right to interfere with our lives or with our rights. And if we actually believe that it is wrong when the state steals or when the state uses force against peaceful people, then the logical connection is that we cannot follow the laws. And it is a very important part, maybe the most important part of the libertarian work today, to tell people that they do not have to follow the laws and the rules of the state. Because you can't say, oh gosh, they, they steal our money and they take our children and put them in this disgusting government school or, socialist school and just accept it. You can't do that. It's not reliable. And you can't say many people, many politicians, so-called liberal or conservative politicians, say that, oh, the humans are socialized. 
and just accept it. You can't do that. It's not reliable. And you can't say we have no freedom of speech. In Sweden, we have a big debate right now um, on this freedom of speech thing with radio stations and TV stations. But still, the total political establishment, they accept the law as it is. And those so-called libertarians seem to do the same. There are two parts of breaking the law that are important. It is self-defense, and it is as a political matter to, to, uh, to use civil disobedience um, in trying to convince people. And the goal, of course, is to make people lose their respect for the state. And to understand that they, as human beings, as individuals, have human rights. But the problem is that almost always there is no one telling people that they actually have their rights. And there is no, no one telling people that the state doesn't have their rights. And there is even fewer that show this and live this way in their political and their private life. But that is important. It is very important. Of course, you always have those no's. People telling that you cannot break the law for different reasons. And one is this idea of how to work politically. We have to be we have to seem respectful because we have to convince people in the parliament. We have to convince people working in the political parties that freedom, individual liberty is the right thing. And then we can't go out there in the street breaking the laws. That's not acting respectful. And those no-no people, they say that it's chaos and anarchy. We, we, no one will believe that this is a sound idea if you act in that way. And I say, bullshit. Because it is never and cannot be our thing to convince the whole political system, or even a part of it, that the ideas are right. We have to start in a different way. The people that change the mentality of people, the way to think in a society, is never politicians, is not political organizations, is not my freedom front, and is not the Libertarian Party or whatever. It is different persons, individuals like actors, like musicians, authors, cultural people. Those are the ones that change mentality in society. And we can only reach to those people by standing beside the political system and doing what we actually believe in. Then some say, no, you cannot break the laws. That's very, maybe sometimes you can find, like in Nazi uh, Germany or so, uh, an example where you could break the law. But in general, no, because then then you lose the respect for the important laws. And if you think that people should follow some of the laws, you cannot yourself break others. That's really, really stupid. Because what are those other laws? They are disrespect. They are the opposite of respect. And since what this person says is that we have to respect each other 
we have to respect each other's property and life. And therefore, we cannot break the laws that don't respect life and property. This argument, I would say, is really out in the blue. In Sweden, we have had a, a debate um, recently on moral debt, I think. I, I, I'm not sure of the word, but moralisk skuld, moral debt. Who is responsible for what has happened in Sweden? And who is responsible for what happened in, in the, the Eastern Europe? Who is responsible for communism and socialism? And they have been putting through all those authors and, and other musicians that really were Marxists and b believed in those ideas and praised the communist China because it was so great. And in Sweden, the same thing. All those authors and, and, and other people that really believed in communism or socialism. And the problem then is, of course, they are responsible. All those people are responsible for what happened because they believed in those ideas. But all of those, what about us? Those that sat in the parliament saying, no, we, we, we shouldn't vote for that, that law. We shouldn't steal people's money, but still accepting it. Those are, in my point of view, morally more responsible because they accepted the system and they let the laws through. So what, what I would recommend is uh, to leave the political parties and to leave the, the, uh, um, the system and to work from outside. And to act on the free market, the really free market of ideas, where you don't have to look on that side and the other side and to, to listen what other people think. And you shouldn't moderate. You should do exactly what you believe in and show it within the political life of yourselves and within the private lives of yourselves. And that is breaking laws and showing people that they have the right to break laws because they have the right to their own lives. Thanks. Thank you. Well, question, please. You advocated that breaking laws, would you then suggest to the people who are younger than you are, who do not really know the difference between good laws and bad laws and moderate laws, how they go about doing that? I ask this question because I have a few youngsters here. Mm. Wow. Okay. Uh, well, young people always are a problem and you cannot solve it with the state at all. I mean, if, they, if your kids go out and do stupid things, you're responsible and you are the one that should know what is right and what is wrong. Uh, but the important thing is that everyone knows what is right and what is wrong in their personal life. And probably most young people, when they do something that is not good, they are aware that they're doing wrong. So uh, I actually don't see, see the problem. I've, I've met the argument many times that uh, people shouldn't be able to, to, uh, to understand what laws are good and what laws are, are bad. But people aren't that stupid. And we have within our culture this very deeply rooted uh, knowledge of what, is, wh what the human rights are. 
So I, 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 I'd say that that problem is not very big. Oh, yes, A and R, please. I think that you were first. OK. Me, me. OK. Um, I was wondering whether you, your strategy for promoting freedom is one that, that where you seem to rely on, on campaigns and doing spectacular things and generally making a nuisance of yourself. Uh, making a nuisance. A nuisance. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. A nuisance. Right? I mean, making all sorts of trouble. And you. Uh, it might be amusing. No, okay. And news. Hmm? And news. And news. Yes, of course. You do all this to attract attention. And, but all in all, it means you, you uh, have to do things that you would not otherwise do. You do it to create an effect. And I'm wondering uh, whether this really leads you to, uh, to really adopting a fairly unnatural lifestyle. The reason I say that is that uh, I've seen the rising importance <coughs> of flash campaigns in politics. Uh, a uh, up and coming member of the uh, youth part of the Progress Party in Norway recently had his photograph taken in the nude in front of the Oslo Town Hall for no other purpose, of course, than to gain attention. So I wonder whether you have uh, reflections on uh, the pitfalls of making a public nuisance uh, of yourself. Well, of course, I, as I said, I believe that there are two parts of civil disobedience. It's self-defense on one hand and uh, a very effective way to participate in the political debate on the other hand. And of course you'll do things that you wouldn't do normally. Um, and I think all of us do. Those working intellectually would probably be doing something more um, useful if we already had a free society. Many of us. I mean, those of us working with, with uh, trying to, to uh, break down the arguments from the socialists, we, we, we would do something else. Uh, but this, this leads me to, uh, to another thing. Of course, I, I still think to, uh, to stand nude outside of, of the, the parliament. I don't really understand the point. Okay, Norway is a little strange that way. So you have, you have all, all your moral uh, and, and rather much um, Christian laws. And I guess it's forbidden to be nude in, in Oslo or, or so, but that was not the thing, I guess. Um, but it is very important to get a message through at the same time. I mean, that is the reason why I break the law. And that, that's why I can't see really the point of standing nude in front of the parliament. Um, I saw a problem when, when I started or after a while, when we had done the radio station, the, the, the bar in the street thing, and uh, another, a couple of other smaller uh, things, we were, or I was, considered a political clown. Just a, uh, a stupid guy breaking the law because he, he felt, well, he thought it was funny or so. And you always have to balance so that you, uh, you, 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 you really get the ideas through. And when you, when you break the laws, if you get the effect that media covers it, what you can get out of it in second hand is to use the interest that the first action 
has created among people uh, by writing articles, by publishing books or booklets. And we have done that a lot. We are made, uh, giving out our magazine, uh, New Liberal and the Neoliberal or so, Libertarian. Um, and we are publishing this booklet that says in here, Are You Stupid? Uh, just to show people and to show journalists and, and, and comment, commenting journalists that there are two parts. There are the ideas that are very strong and that we believe in, and there are the actions too. Please. Uh, do you say that the radio station? No. The radio station, what happened was that we started the station on Friday. And we were sending for like six hours, and then we quit, went home, and got back on Saturday, started sending, and well, there were always all, all people calling on the phone and saying like, great, go on, and so. Uh, all of a sudden, my sister, who was listening to this radio station, called and said, now it's gone. The signal, we, we can't hear anything. Hmm, okay, so I hang the phone up and immediately someone else rang. And it was a neighbor from the other side of the, the street. This was a rather tall uh, house in, in the old town of Stockholm. And we had the uh, antenna on top of the roof. And this guy, this neighbor calling said that, oh, now, now there's someone out on the roof, so I, I think it's, it's now, it, now it's gone. Now they'll kick you out of the air. So I, I was really furious. There was someone actually up on the, the roof ruining our antenna. So I ran out of the door, and there were, at the same time, from the, the, the next door, three really big guys coming out dressed in in a tie and and well they were from the special force <laughs> the Stockholm police special force those that deal with with um, um, terrorists. terrorists and really bad stuff <laughs> so what they had done was that they cut the antenna off on on the roof and then when I got out they they took my keys and locked the door and unlocked the door and went down there and they handcuffed me to the to the the uh, the stairway and they took all our things away and we are still waiting for the trial uh, because as I usually say that the uh, uh, the law system in Sweden, the justice system, is socialized also, so it takes a lot of time. Uh, this was many years now. But also, in Sweden, we have a system where if one person breaks the law uh, many times, they try to, to, uh, to take it all at once. So since we keep on doing new stupid things, uh, <laughs> they have to... to uh, May have it get a new date for. <laughs> so, in other words, if you keep on breaking law all the time, you will never come to trial. <laughs> <laughs> it's been that way until now. I don't know if I uh, do break real laws. I guess they'll they'll have a little more a hurry. Hey, no. Please. Thank you. Uh, thank you I'd like to follow up your question. Uh, I think that you've regretted it uh, a little bit too easy, saying that people knows the people know what are just laws and unjust laws. Uh, the problem is that you know what we're doing, we know what we are doing when we're breaking laws. Um, but the problem with being a martyr also is that it breaks uh, personal problems. Uh, you might not be aware of when you're sitting at the Freedom uh, Front's pub at 2 o'clock in the morning discussing whether we should sell liquor, whether we should resist the draft or something like that for someone who is 17 years old. 
and he's very impressed with this uh, movement. Uh, it might be a shock when he actually is facing his parents and saying, hey, I get a two, two month sentence because I'm resisting the draft. And uh, I would like to ask you, don't you consider this a, a moral problem, a moral dilemma sometimes, to actually advocate to young people that they should be martyrs without telling them what the actual consequences might be, even if in the long run it has good effects. They are the one they are the other ones sacrificing at this moment and they're the young ones. And they we often don't know what they're doing. That's my first question for your question. Um, second thing, uh, I think we should discuss it. Jim and I have been discussing it also prison yesterday. Um, is that five years ago it was very easy to shock people simply by being libertarian. Um, it was very easy to get the invitations to uh, ordinary parties, like you mentioned, and just sit down and tell them what you thought. Because that shocked them. It's someone who's against taxes, someone who would like to legalize drugs, someone uh, standing up against the draft, things like that. That doesn't shock people anymore, because we've had a very, very positive development in society. General opinion has changed. Uh, maybe I'm, I'm a bit too optimistic, but I think that everyone, almost everyone, is some sort of libertarian today, even if they don't always see the, uh, the, the political implications. No one is actually against liberty anymore. Uh, and what I would like to ask you is, I think that this has created a problem for us. Uh, we, in some way, have to change the strategy. Is it two ways out of this? Either we take an intellectual way and start to uh, tell people why they've got rights, because everyone believes they've got rights today. You don't surprise anyone by saying that, that he has a right to, 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 to life, liberty, and so forth. Um, or you could uh, try the uh, law breaking method instead. I'd like to hear you elaborate a bit on this problem as the society and religion has changed. Uh, third thing, um, you mentioned in your uh, introductory remarks uh, another organization, namely FMSF, uh, which was and is uh, the only libertarian organization for students. So I thought the JD behind Freedom Front, but also behind the, the, the New Liberal, was that we should fill the vacuum of a libertarian organization for non-students. Then, according to the program, uh, your speech is called the student development. Uh, does this mean that uh, the Freedom Front here is competing with FNSF for students as well, or do you try to fill the vacuum for non-students? Could you please uh, explain that? Yeah, we compete with FMSF on engaging the students very much, we do. But still, I would say that the most important thing is that those that believe in the political party system, they can join, join the FMSF, fine. Those that don't believe in it, they can join the Freedom Front. And those that want to uh, get a good place to uh, make a career within the moderate party, I think FMSF is great. Uh, very nice set of me. Um, the, the pro there were two more questions here that I tried to answer. Um, of course, some years ago, uh, it was very, very interesting to, to listen to those strange people that said so stupid things that no one ever could believe in. And it's not that extreme anymore. Uh, but still, I think that you're totally wrong when you say that our new goal could be to, to prove intellectually why people actually have rights, since they already know that they do. Because people don't. People don't know that they have rights. People. 99% still believe that they have a moral duty to follow the, the laws that the majority decides. They believe in, in, um, in the right of the many to, to rule a country and to rule their lives too. Um, and of course it's, it's more difficult and uh, you have to, to uh, work in 
to some extent in other ways, but I still believe that the, the uh, civil disobedience uh, works fine and is a good, good thing to do. Um, but to combine it, to, to, to uh, try to convince people that they should not pay taxes and that they have no moral duty to pay taxes and that they should try to get a, uh, what do you call it, swat job, black job on the black market uh, so you can keep your money out of the state. Um, that is very controversial in Sweden. Um, and, and the thing is that we have to try to, to get through in media and just tell people those things. I still think that is the, the, main, uh, the, the main thing we should do. Um, young people, 17 year old, uh, and, and we tell them to, to uh, uh, not join, to, to not accept the, the, uh, the draft or so. Well, if the state use, tries to use a 17 year old in the military force, uh, on, on, uh, and, and try to use him by force, I, I think that person probably also is capable of deciding over himself. And uh, the important part is that this question leads to where, where a kid is get, starts to get grown up and when the parents don't have the uh, the, the right to decide over the, the kid anymore and so on. And that's another, another problem, but uh, still I think that it's rather upblown and it's not very important in this discussion. But you don't find a moral dilemma? No, I don't find a moral dilemma at all. Not at all. Do you uh, agree with the tax laws, and uh, or do you break the tax laws? And if you do, what are the consequences? And if not, uh, what do you think they would be if you did uh, disobey the tax laws? Well, I break them as much as I can, and I I tell people to do the same. Um, the problem is that. You're not a very good freedom fighter, fighter from within four walls. I mean, from prison, you can't do very much. And you all, always have to, uh, uh, to measure pros and cons. Um, Does that mean you think they would more strongly enforce the tax laws than they do the radio and the drinking beers? <coughs> To some extent, yes. If I if I were was caught with uh, uh, not having paid taxes uh, and refusing to pay them, uh, even by w after getting caught, they will uh, put me in prison for sure. And it's so stupid. I refuse to uh, to uh, make my declaration of income income declaration. And what they did is that they, they just guess how much I probably could have had as an income. So now I've got some 55,000 kroners um, that I'm supposed to pay in tax that I owe the state. And the thing is I, I didn't even earn any money that year. I was just working with the FMSF and, and uh, or FMS and, and the, the Freedom Front and it didn't earn a, a nickel. So, uh, and also the problem is what they do then is that uh, when I work, if I, if I get a proper work, the, uh, the, the state will be there and grab the money before I even get it. So. It's really, it's really a tough problem to, to keep your own money. Uh, and what I do now then, of course, is that I have created a system where I... The, the little money I earn, I earn um, straight. So it doesn't go through the state.
And they're, they're breaking the laws, and they uh, the only enforcement is some uh, giving you paperwork saying you owe them more. No, not that. Those are two different two different things. Um, the money I earn that the state doesn't know, they don't know, and they have a tough time uh, finding it out. Uh, but when they do know, or when they do think that I did have an income, and I just refused to, to declare how much an income I had, then they just grab a figure and try to... Well, they, they've already ta taken some, some from my bank account that I had forgotten there, so the state came and took it. Um, and that's what happens. So you still owe them money? Yes, but oh, it's so stupid. I, I've, I just hate those, all those papers, and, and it really makes me feel bad to have to to declare what how much I earned and all this and fill in the stupid forms. So I didn't do it for that reason, and it turned out not so good. And therefore, I have. Uh, a guy who, who knows law and, and all this, who tries to help me to get out on the good way. Because you cannot, in Sweden, you cannot um, get successfully out of such a thing. Where can you? <laughs> I was really interested in your uh, bar, uh, it plays very industrial noise music, by the way, and I like that pretty well. Um, but with respect to the educational aspects of, of the situation, how much do you feel the uh, ideas are being transmitted to the, to the casual person who comes in? And, and are you specifically trying to make a big effort, a, a medium effort, or, or just a very relaxed effort? Uh, and, and what do you think the effects are on the average person who just wants there to drink after three and, and have a party? Well, both things. Of course, when they come there after three o'clock, they've been out since 10 and they're very drunk. Uh, we have problems con convincing them, but still they, they start discussions and that's okay. They buy books sometimes. And of course we try to use, to some extent, the walls to, to, to get uh, information through and, and blow up quotations and so on. But the, the, the most important thing I, be thing, I believe is, um, that those people uh, understand what we stand for just because we do it. And those of them that are interested in uh, ideas, they get a, a, a positive uh, feeling from the beginning. Have you uh, uh, contacted or gotten in contact with any artists or musicians or authors from this bar who have indicated to you that they were interested in those ideas. I mean, because I think your oh, yes. earlier comments about the artists and the culture molding people are, are very pertinent. A lot, a lot. And I mean, young people, young, young journalists, for example, they, they mostly work with, um, I mean, that they don't decide very much in, in, on the magazines or in, in the newspapers today. But they go there and they know us and they know what we stand for and they believe that it's right and that it's good. And in 10 or 15 years, those guys will be uh, in, in a deciding position in, in the media. Um, authors, yes. And, and uh, musicians, we, uh, we have had several uh, what you call concerts or musicians playing there, so so it, it works that way. Right. Um, 
about taxation, I know that you're not an anarchist, or in favor of some limited state. Um, uh, I'm not sure. And, <laughs> well, okay. Um, you know, they, they have a problem. I haven't seen any, any reasonable example of how you can finance a state without taxation or, or uh, influence with big liberty. Mm -hmm. And uh, but I think obviously you have, have to, if you have to have states, you have, have to have taxation. And uh, then you have a moral problem. If you're in favor of, of, uh, of human rights uh, all the way, how can you unite that with, with taxation? First and secondly, if if you're in favor of taxation, isn't tax the taxation basically is uh, then should be a, a good law? But, you know, the, the, the level of taxation is today is very high. But obviously, you, if you're in favor of, of, of the state finance or uh, with taxes, you you have to consider that law as as uh, being good on on the basic level. No, no, Ab absolutely not, absolutely not. Maybe I can say that. Um, okay, 2% tax to pay for those things that cannot be, be arranged in the on the market. But that does not ever make me uh, having a duty to pay taxes that actually uh, are used to decide my own choices or that are used to enforce uh, different morals or so on, on other people. Um, and also, uh, you, can, you, can, you can see, you can view this in a, pro what do you call it, pragmatical, in a pragmatical way. That the state and the political system almost always tries to widen its, it, it, its, uh, sphere. And they do that all the time until they come to a point where it's not possible for them anymore. And a very effective way to, to uh, make that point uh, on, a better, on a better place, to, to, to make it earlier, is, is civil disobedience and refusing to pay taxes. So that's my answer. Yeah. And if you're in favor of that, you're, it's likely that's not your human right. That's a sort of, of your territory. Why do I have to pay 2% of my income in tax? Because you, you think there are uh, certain institutions that are not producing on the market. We uh, published a book called The Vision of a Civilized Society. And we declared that in future we would not like there to be any taxes at all because, of course, all taxes are uh, violating uh, people's rights. Well, how are we going to find out the state? They're not kicking us off the street. Can I mention something about Yeah, please, please. Well, with respect to financing the state, one of the key things that the state does is enforce contracts. And you can, in fact, consider the user fee on every contract as a fee for the enforcement. And that user fee might be, uh, say, 10% of the value of your contract with an employer, uh, such that for you to have a contract that's enforceable by this enforcement agency, you have to agree to give 10% of your uh, income from the employer for this enforcement purpose. Now, that might be very similar to a tax, but, but if you don't pay that, you don't have to, but then if they don't pay you, you don't have any recourse to loss. Uh, and you might consider a situation like that in a hypothetical sense or in a very real sense and allow people to choose. Uh, and I think that there are ways to have contracts and have uh, essentially, I, I would call an enforcement mechanism, essentially a, a, a government, uh, without strict taxes, okay, in that sense. Well, you can also have voluntary taxes. Well, those are contributions to the government. Contributions, right. Well, you have a problem. I can't 
I can enforce my contract. Should be forbidden to enforce contracts with uh, other national states. It will never make you violate the right to liberty, the right, the right to have a company uh, enforcing enforcing uh, contracts. You, you can't, you can't, I mean, in some sense you, you violate people's rights. If you're in favor of rights all the way, you, you're going to violate them by having the state. And I don't think say, if you say it's right or wrong, but I think it's a problem if you are for natural rights. You can't, you don't, probably you can't be in favor, uh, favor of the state. In, in any natural rights, there's still an enforcement mechanism. And at some level, you're going to have enforcement mechanisms disagreeing with other enforcement mechanisms. And it's going to be at a final enforcement mechanism. And that final enforcement mechanism might as well be called a state. Because you and your enforcement mechanism are in a disagreement with me and my enforcement mechanism. So our, our, our ideas are either we come to some higher level of enforcement mechanism where we arbitrate and decide on agreement. And if we don't agree, and we don't agree, and we don't agree, and we're willing to fight over it, then have a fight. Or there's some final enforcement mechanism that says this is the this is the solution for you to, and we this final enforcement mechanism are going to propose it. Uh, and, and I think that that happens, you know, in, in any realistic sense. So, anyway, but but I think there are opportunities for government services to be totally user-fee based and thereby not taxed per se. Okay.